All right, welcome back, Chelsea fans, to another episode of the London is Blue podcast. I, of course, am your host, Nick. Joined today, uh, back from vacation, uh, Matt Law. How are we doing? What's going on? And uh, and how was your uh, how was your trip away? Yeah, good. Actually, I've not been away. It's, it's not been a vacation. It's just been a job. Staycation. Jobs. Staycation. Yeah, break a break after the Euros. I've got another break coming, as I was just describing to you. So it's a bit of a weird time for me. Um, but yeah. Just trying to get myself back into the swing of things and then i'll stop again for a bit and then start proper so always a bit weird after a major tournament but there we go i've been keeping on i've been keeping on top of things as much as i can anyway because like i said i haven't been away yeah i don't, I don't think i've seen you since the the end of the euros uh what was your take on the entire tournament now that oh, you're kind wow. of back and settled yeah it feels weird now um it feels like even though I think I've been back less than a month, but it feels like a lifetime ago already. Yeah, it was weird. It's weird. It's still we we got to a final England, which should have been satis- should have been quite good, but still doesn't feel very satisfactory to be honest with you. The way it all went, didn't play well. Lots of questions sort of left unanswered. So yes, it was a, it was a, from an England point of view, it was a strange tournament to cover. Yeah, yeah, it uh, it was close again, but no cigar, unfortunately. Exactly. Uh, Exactly. I think Spain were deserving winners, yeah? Yes, exactly, exactly. I just didn't really feel we ever got going at any moment. I can remember about 45 minutes of good football, but there we go. I'm trying to move on from that anyway, Nick. Come on. Sorry, sorry. No <laughs> no more pain. No more pain. Uh, look, we're going to be talking transfers. We're going to be talking uh, what Maresca has to do to get ready for the start of the season in precisely – uh, 10 days from now, which is wild to say that we're already into mid August and yeah. uh, everyone's going back to school in the United States. And we have a, a fresh start here for the Premier League season. So, uh, of course, uh, please uh, subscribe via YouTube, hit that bell icon so you get notified. Five star reviews, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. It's the best way uh, for new folks to find our show. Uh, if you want to join the Discord, there's a uh, healthy discussion going on about all the transfers in there. And then the Dispatch, uh, CFC Central's uh, weekly newsletter that has uh, been on fire lately and uh, not not in a good way. So uh, <laughs> join that one and, and see, how, uh, see how Sam is feeling about the state of Chelsea. All right, Matt, we're going to dive straight into this. Yep. Uh, we're going to talk a little outgoing before we talk incoming because it feels like there's a lot more on the outgoing than there is on the incoming. Uh, Chelsea have done a lot of business this summer already, uh, but with a bloated squad and a lot of uh, pieces yet to be moved, it feels like we're finally starting the outgoing uh, marathon that we're going to be going through. Um, the biggest one, uh, in addition to those who have already left, like Ian Monson, Lewis Hall, Amari Hutchinson, Ziyech, Thiago Silva, is obviously over the last uh, five, six days, Connor Gallagher has really picked up. This is one we have been talking about for, it feels like, two years now. <laughs> exactly. Um, frankly, so, I, you know, not a massive surprise, but I think some palpable uh, disappointment uh, from some of the Chelsea fan base, not all. I would count myself in that. Uh, and then some uh, palpable relief from others. What, what are your... I mean, with all the rumors and everything going on that you know he wouldn't have been accepted back in the first team squad or would have only been a bit part player at at maximum, what are your thoughts on this whole saga and and where it kind of leaves Chelsea, even if they get the result that they want? So I'm relieved from all perspective that the saga is finally going to have some closure. I know it might not be the closure people want, and I get that, and it's it's... I would probably agree with the people who who feel that it's the wrong type of closure. But um, I think it's important there's some closure. Because like you say, we've been talking about Conor Gallagher and his future for, if not a year, but, well, a year at least, if not 18 months. Um, you know, it seems to have overlapped with when we were talking about Mason Mount's future this time last year. And it's it's just been a bit of a, a cloud over Chelsea, I've felt, um, and an issue that no one... It's been an issue for head coaches. Pochettino could never really properly talk about it. Maresca clearly can't really talk about it. It needed to be done one way or the other before the start of the season. So first things first, I think the closure, even though it might not be the closure that everybody wants, is is a good thing before the start of the season. Because I'd, I'd have worried if this would have hung over everybody 
going into the season, particularly as as we found out last week, um, it would have also meant that that Connor would have not been training with the first team squad, um, which would have been a, a crazy situation. Would have really put an even bigger cloud over things. So it's important that they got back, and that that scenario never had to play out. Um, look, I think it's a positive that he's from Chelsea's point of view that he's been sold abroad. You know, at one stage, it really did look like Tottenham were favourites. They never actually made a bid in the end. They did a lot of sort of inquiring and looking and asking questions. And I think that they never actually wanted to get involved at the level it ended up being. I think their strategy had been to leave it till the end of the window and hope to pick him up very cheap. And that sort of has backfired on them a little bit. Um, Villa had an offer accepted. He didn't really want to go there. I think Villa's offer accepted was at a time when Villa had basically just sold Douglas Louise or in the process of selling Douglas Louise and hadn't really signed anyone then. Now, from what I'm told is that at that time, Connor didn't want to be the first one through the door at Villa. He wanted to see, he wanted to have a better idea of where Villa were going because obviously they were selling a key player and not signing anyone at the time. Had Villa actually had an offer accepted this month closer to now, Connor's decision might have been different on that, but Villa didn't want to hang around and quickly pivoted to to Anana. Um, So, yeah, I think it's a plus for Chelsea that he's gone abroad, even though it's probably meant that it's a slightly lower fee, because I think I discussed on one of the pods that I I went on fairly recently that that Atletico just weren't ever going to get close to the sort of 40, 50 million well, they got close to 40 in fairness, but they were never going to get close to 50 million. I always worried that personal terms would be a problem for Atletico as well, but they've obviously done something now. I'm told it's heavily bonused and heavily incentivized deal. So, yeah, I'm re- I'm relieved we're not going to have to keep talking about it, but I get why why people are upset about it. And we've, we've talked about the reasons for that plenty of times, haven't we? Um, it, it appears that the next one, uh, as you reported, will be Chalba. Uh, this has been another one that I think the uh, the larger fan base, especially given the performance of the defense in preseason, are puzzled by and uh, count me in that group as well. Uh, these fees are ridiculous, by the way. Um, you know, Twenty-five million for Chalba, thirty-three million for Gallagher. But if if I just interrupt here. you though, if I just interrupt you on Chalba, you can't ask. I I would like someone at Chelsea to explain the negotiating position on Chalaba because you can't ask a big fee for a player who you don't take on tour. You've killed your negotiating position. You've absolutely yeah. obliterated it. You, you you know you've you've put yep. it out to the world that you don't want this player and if this player stays he's not going to be part of anything. So, you know, the valuation is is really interesting with Trevor because even at twenty five million, I think there'll be clubs out there at the moment who who might hope to even pick him up for less now that Chelsea have made their position so clear on on, on Chalaba. And if you relate it to, you know, we've spoken on this pod many times. I covered Tottenham quite closely. Relate it to how. T- Tottenham are playing it with Oliver Skip, who is an academy graduate at Tottenham. He is pretty much available for transfer this summer. But Tottenham aren't saying anything about him. They took him on tour. They're not making it clear. They're trying to keep his value up. And yet it's clear that they would accept a bid for Oliver Skip. I don't understand at all the negotiating or the sort of the process on, on Chalabar to not take him and expect to be able to negotiate well on him. So it's very, very odd. It's also very odd. The the big difference, obviously, with Chalabar and Gallagher, look, I get it from Chelsea's point of view. They had a contract situation with Gallagher. Situation, you could argue, could have been sorted out differently, but they did have a contract situation with Gallagher. They gave Chalabar a long-term contract about 18 months ago, I think, or less than two years ago, maybe November 22, something like that. Um... So there's no contract issue with Chalaba. You know, it's not like they have a problem with his contract. They've just decided for whatever reason they want him out of the door. I don't get it. I don't really like it. Um, but he is going to... I think this is the summer where probably Trevor has actually... Last, last summer, he refused a, a move to Nottingham Forest. He backed himself to win over the manager, which he's, he's backed himself so many times to do that, and he seems to do it every single time. Um, by the end of the season, you know, as we've discussed, he was he was probably yep. the best defender on the books. 
I think this summer, from what I understand, is Trevor has, has kind of accepted it's different and I'm going to have to go. I don't want to go, but I'm going to have to go. Um, but he's not going to be forced to go somewhere he doesn't want to go. So, you know, I, I don't think Nottingham Forest are in for him again. But if not, if a club like Nottingham Forest came along again, he wouldn't go to that. He's still going to back himself to go to a good club. Um, and the strange thing for Trevor is I think he needs to see how the market plays out a little bit because he's, he's number one and a half stroke two on a lot of lists. You know, Crystal Palace really like him. They've got a Wolfsburg defender. They're, they're also after West Ham really like him who are selling uh, Kurt Zuma. But they've got a few defenders on their list. I think Villa even like him. Villa are probably going to do a centre-back at some point this summer, but they've probably got other people above him. So he's kind of number two on a lot of lists, which again surprises me because I think he'll end up being a wonderful signing for someone. But he's going to have to see how the market just plays out a little bit. But he'll he'll get a move, I'm pretty sure, this summer. I mean, let's talk about a couple of things with Trev, and I think these can be extrapolated out into... Uh, others that, that we can speak of from an outgoing perspective as well. They gave him this contract, right? So they know the terms, the The front office know the terms, the sporting directors and the owners know what's going on. Uh, obviously, he's had a bit of a rough time with injuries. And that's not something that I've ever, you know, when I've, I've been battling people on Twitter about you know, the value of Trev Chalaba, this has been something that of course is brought up and that, you know, he hasn't uh, been fully healthy for a couple of seasons and has gone through injuries, but uh, they gave him the contract, and mm. it feels as if to me they're they're going ah, we gave you this contract, but re- what what's really the value of, of of a contract? Like we can just move you whenever we want to. Do you think that that will give other players massive pause in the way that they are looking at? extensions or even first contracts with Chelsea. Obviously Chelsea's, you know, plan here is to uh, create the longest contract to amortize the value of those mm. deals for, for as much as possible. Like, do you think other players are going to look at this Trev Chalaba example, the way that they're treating Connor, the way that they've gone about their business in other areas and go, I don't know. I don't know if this is the right fit for me. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's very clear now that the Chalaba contract was a value retention tool. And, uh, you know, I, I just can't believe that they can... That they've tanked themselves. Like well, that, they've ended up tanking, it? yeah. But the, I can't believe, given they've now tried to sell him so hard the last two summers, that they ever really thought it, he was a guy they, they wanted to sort of uh, trust their trust their future in. It just feels like they, they gave him that contract to try and boost his value. And as you say, they've... They've weirdly tanked that this summer. Um, look, I, I think I think what's gone on with Connor and Trevor will give people pause for thought within that that Chelsea squad. You know, it, it has to. If you just normalise it into a normal work environment and you have colleagues who certain things happen to them and they're told certain things and, you know, they're left behind off tours or left behind, left out of things, then it's going to create you know, chatter within a workforce. It's going to create uh, doubts in people's heads about what might happen to them down the line when, you know, Chelsea might be looking at going in a different direction. So all of that, yeah, all of that. Look, I, I can't I can't sit here and say for sure that it's going to have an immediate detrimental effect or that it's going to stop people signing contracts because at the end of the day, you know, footballers and football agents do like lucrative long contracts because it gives them a lot of security even if they end up, having to move after a couple of seasons of them. And, you know, Trevor decided to sign that contract at the time. I mean, an, another person who's probably going this summer is Armando Brozier, and he he was given a very long contract at around the same time as Trevor Chalaber, I think, uh, a very long-term contract. Another player who's had an injury and another player, he was taken on tour. He seems to be being treated a bit differently. Again, that's weird. Why is Armando, Armando Brozier being treated one way and Trevor Chalaber's being treated another way? Their situations are very, very similar in a way. The club is open to offers on both and wants to sell both of them, has plenty of other options in their sort of area of the pitch and wants to sign the players in the area of the pitch. Yet one goes on tour, one doesn't. Um, yeah, I, 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 I do think it will give people pause for thought. Whether it, it has a detrimental impact in the short term, I'm, I'm reticent to say that because it's easy to assume that sometimes and yet football is such a sort of business that, that people still send, tend to 
take these contracts when they're offered them and then and then back themselves to either sort of fulfill them or or get a move in any case but it's it's a really weird scenario i've got to be honest you you mentioned armando armando Breyer. this last one we'll do before break but um any options for him i mean maresca comes out and says uh you know, it was a decision to leave him out of the real madrid game uh, altogether uh in this moment we'll see what happens this this seems to be a pretty uh, common phrase from from maresca on transfers that he doesn't really want to talk about but has to talk about thoughts on Broya really quick. I think he'll go. Um, he's got some interest. We know that Everton like him if they can sell Calvert Lewin. They're still trying to sell Calvert Lewin this this window, but that might run right to the end. He's got some good interest from abroad that I know about that I can't really publicize at the moment. I do wonder whether that interest from abroad is what kept him out of that Real Madrid squad because I think some talks have been held with with one club at least. Um, yeah, I think he'll go, and I think. What I don't know at the moment is whether he'll go permanently or on loan. It could be either. Chelsea will definitely hope to do it permanently, I think, because particularly if it ends up being overseas, I've only got so many overseas loans to play with. Um, yeah. But yeah, Bro- Broya, Broya will go one way or the other. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that because he's got some good interest. And I think there'll, there'll be enough strike a merry-go-round around Europe. There are, there's some quite interesting spots come up towards the end of the window. We, we haven't actually spoken about Lukaku yet either, but maybe we do we'll that do, after the break. Well, we'll we'll do that right after the break. <laughs> How about that? So uh, thank you, of course, the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right, Matt, we are, uh, we're now back. And uh, look, you, you kind of n- made the nice segue before we... Uh, before we went to break, but Lukaku has been a name on, on everyone's uh, mind again after, you know, some rumors of him wanting to go to Napoli, Chelsea not wanting to sell for less than 37 million pounds that are rumored, uh, you know, some other interest in, in players like Cassidy and Keppa from Napoli um, and this, you know, never ending uh, transfer rumor about Victor Osiman coming the other way break that whole thing down for us and and kind of give us the latest and greatest about where Lukaku might end up. Well, we're in the Lukaku saga, basically, which we seem to be stuck in every single summer. 18 summers of Lukaku. Exactly. Lukaku. Will this ever end? I don't think well, this will ever end. This will be a, a never-ending saga that we're not allowed out of. It feels like we're being punished for something in a previous life. Um, so Lukaku has agreed in principle to go to Napoli, as far as I understand, obviously wants to go and play for Conte. Seems to be the only manager in the world football that Lukaku really wants to play for. Um, I, weird that. I was trying to think of players who are so linked to one manager. I'm sure there are lots of examples, but Lukaku is it's unbelievable, really. But he wants to go to Napoli. Obviously, Conte wants him. But Napoli haven't made a bid. You know, Napoli asked what, what the situation was with Lukaku a few weeks ago. We're told that it's this clause, which is around £37.8 million. And we're told, as we've heard nearly every summer, he's not available for loan. And funnily enough, Chelsea haven't heard back from them, as far as I'm aware. So I suspect that Napoli, like the rest of us, probably think, well, we've seen this story before. This is a familiar dance. Chelsea seems to be playing on this one. It's not Chelsea's fault. Remember, they inherited this Lukaku problem. This is not, you know, you can level a lot of things at a a lot of people since the, the takeover, but this is not a... Uh, a new ownership problem, Lukaku. Um, and I actually think they've they've, they've done pretty well in, on the whole with Lukaku. One thing to really remember with Lukaku, which is important at the moment, is that when they renegotiated his contract to go out on loan last summer, they massively reduced his wages as part of the agreement to let him go out on loan. So he is not sat at Chelsea burning a hole in the wage bill like he would have been and, and has been in the past. So... That is a major, major plus because his his wages having to come back to Chelsea came down an awful lot. Um, nobody wants to say quite what, but it's very, very significant. So that is a, a good thing and a different thing. He's not he's not coming back on sort of near enough three hundred grand a week. Um, uh, but you know they keep saying he's not available for loan. I'm told there's not a market in Saudi for him this year. Now whether that changes or not, we'll wait and see. But currently. I've checked with people I trust in Saudi. I've checked with people I trust around the player. And I'm told at the moment there's nothing in Saudi. So it seems that we're in a Napoli or bus situation, but it it seems that we're in 
an interim bus situation in other years and other things came up. So I'm, I'm reluctant to, to say it's, it's definitely only Napoli, but he wants Napoli. Conte wants him. It was going to, it's clearly going to run till the end. And in the meantime, he, he's kicking his heels. I'm, I'm told he's, he's come back to London. I'm not even actually fully sure if he's training at Cobham at the moment with the development and 21 squad or whether he's not training at Cobham, whether he's on his own training somewhere, it's very hard to get <laughs> concrete information on him. But what we do know is that Chelsea are stuck with this problem again. He will go. If it gets to the last week, he'll end up going on loan, I'm pretty sure, to Napoli. Um, but Chelsea are going to hold on until then to try and actually get rid of him permanently because they're as sick as the rest of us are with this uh, ongoing nightmare that comes up every summer. But like I say, at least at least it's not the wage bill burner it, it used to be. And that makes it easier yeah. for him to go somewhere else, as, of course, as well. Because last year, Chelsea were having to negotiate their way around his wage bill, which basically nobody outside Saudi could afford. And that's now quite different to, to what it would have been before this time last year. No major signing has tanked their own value as quickly as he has. That that was... Uh, what a career. He, he, he's one of the yeah. strangest careers ever. He, I mean, yep. looking back on that guy's career, I don't want to spend an episode on Lukaku, but one of the strangest careers ever. Um, uh, another, you know, one that you could argue has been, uh, one of Chelsea's all time strangest transfers is Kepa also been linked with moves in various places. Any updates on, on what will happen with Kepa because Chelsea now have eight goalkeepers. Uh, they just signed a new one and have, have some loans to make obviously with the youngsters, but Kepa and Georgie Petrovic are two that you just, I don't know what's going to happen here. Yeah, look, I feel a bit sorry for Georgi Petrovic, but on to Kepa. Um, it feels very much like they're, they're waiting to see what happens to Lunin at Real Madrid. Uh, there's a lot of talk that Lunin will be sold because Courtois is back now and Lunin boosted his value up so much standing in for him that they can get a good fee for Lunin. If Lunin goes, Kepa will go back, probably on loan to Real Madrid again. Um, the loans, I think, in terms of FFP and everything actually work better for Chelsea than what they'd get in terms of selling him. I, it's very complicated, but I think the loans with a small fee um, and eating up another year mm. actually end up working better on the FFP and PSR than selling him for well below his book value. Um, so, yeah, that, that's where I see it. I think Kepa will end up going back to Real Madrid, but it's a waiting game on Lunin in the meantime. In, in terms of all the other goalies, I mean, I don't know about Petrovic. I'd imagine he'll have some interest. I, I haven't made... Since I wrote the story shortly coming off one of these these pods, actually, about them signing a goalkeeper and, and Petrovic probably being available, I haven't managed to make a check on him. Um, I will do. But, yeah, I, I, they, when I spoke to them, they seemed pretty confident. It felt like they already had some interest in him. Interesting. Um, Chilwell is an interesting one. Uh, there were some nondescript comments made from Maresca about the fit in his system for uh, someone like Ben Chilwell, who is an out and out, you know, wing back and not an inverted fullback. I think it's a fair enough assessment to make about, you know, the fit in the system. Any concrete interest in someone like Ben Chilwell? I can't see Ben Chilwell leaving this summer. He's on, he's on big wages. I think he's on near enough 200,000 pounds a week. Another player they gave a new contract to remember, um, albeit a short a short extension, but they extended his contract. Um, and I, I think that that level of wages will make it basically impossible to move him on this summer. Um, and I just don't quite see who's out there who needs a left back enough to really push the boat out. Remember, all clubs are struggling against, you know, having to be very careful with the PSR and everything, given everyone's terrified of, of putting their backs up against the wall on it. So... I don't see a move for him. I think he's going to have to, they're going to have to do some work on the coaching pitch and training pitch. I, I don't like the comments, actually. I, I'm, this isn't like some massive takedown of Mareska. Please don't read it this way. I, I, I haven't been around him at all yet, so I, I wouldn't want to be seen to being positive or negative about him yet. It wouldn't be fair either way. I don't like the suggestion, though, oh, this player just can't play in my system. You know, or this player can't play in his system. Well, that's what the training pitch is for. You know, he's an international footballer. He's an intelligent lad. I'm sure he can be coached. 
So instead of just writing the guy off and saying, oh, well, he's a traditional left back, he can't play for Maresca. Okay, maybe he can't start the season for Maresca. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. But let's see what happens after three months on the training pitch with him and some coaching, shall we? Let's see. I've seen so many players under different managers manage to reinvent themselves in different ways. I don't really see why we just write off Ben as not being able to do that. So, I, I look, I don't think they will sell him. I don't think they can sell him. I don't want them to sell him. And I'd just like people to give him a bit of time and actually give him a bit of respect, in fact, of, well, why can't he play for this guy? It can't, it can't be impossible. He can be coached. The guy who has to give him time is the guy making those comments, though, and that's that's going to be... that. That's uh, why the comments you know. I didn't... Uh, without, like I say, I, I don't want to go in two-footed on Maresca because I've not even sat in front of the guy yet, but um, that's why I didn't really like that comment, but maybe there was a bit more context to it than that, that one comment. I only saw the dangers of seeing a comment on social media and not seeing the, the full interview or being sat in the full interview is why I'm a bit reluctant to go too hard on that. All right, give me percentages that these <laughs> players are sold uh, for these four players. Uh, Tino Andrin, Cesare Cassade, um, uh, Carney Chukomeka, and David Dachra Fafana. Can I have sold or loaned? Uh, you can you can have sold or loaned. Uh, I'm I'm leaning sell on these, but you, yeah, hit me with what you got. Uh, Dachra Fafana, hundred percent will leave. It might be a loan with an obligation or an option rather than a, a straight out sale. Um, Cassaday, I'm 90% sure will leave. I think he will be a sale. Um, Angerin, uh, again, I would say probably 100% will leave. Uh, loan or sale, I'm, I'm finding that one difficult to call. So you're going to have to give me loan or sale on that one. And Carney, Carney's a really interesting one. Carney, 50-50, 50-50. You guys actually, I mean, I've only watched broken little highlights of the tour and kept in touch with what Maresca was saying and stuff. You guys will have watched him far more lately than me. How did he look like he fit into it all at, at the moment? 50-50. He was playing more as like an eight, uh, which yeah. is, you know, kind of where I foresaw him playing. Uh, I think he had a rough first game I think he got a little bit um, better in the second halves of both the first and second games I don't think we saw him the last three games so no uh, or if we did it was for limited minutes so I yeah I don't know my, my worry for him is as well as that Cole hasn't been involved and I think yeah. it's fairly clear that Cole's going to play more might maybe more like a 10 than an 8 but he's going to play more in field uh, it seems and you've also got Enzo, who only came into that late as well. Um, they're definitely. I know they feel they're a midfielder, one at least one too many in that sort of who they see as first team yep. squad. Because I, I did make checks when they were weirdly linked to the Celtic midfielder and was told absolutely not. And if anything, we've got at least one midfielder too many. So, yeah, if Carney is not in that first squad of the season, I think Carney alarm bells will ring for Carney, and he might have to start having discussions with people. Um, but again, he's another one who a couple of weeks ago they were saying they'd only consider a sale and not a loan on. They don't want to loan him. Um, so we'll, we'll wait and see on Carney. But Carney, probably I'm, I'm at the moment, 50 50. Uh, one that kind of popped up this morning, and I think this player is is probably the next great uh, saga that Chelsea deal with, is Joshua Keen Pong, who. Uh, rumors are out there that um, PSG Real Madrid are looking at him as a right back option for the future. Uh, he was obviously involved on Chelsea summer tour and uh, had his debut last year. And uh, you know, is, is uh, by all accounts, by all scouts is very highly rated uh, coming through the Academy. Any, any thoughts around, you know, some of the best Academy talent, what they're looking at this situation like and, and how they might function as you know a, a new player who has some newly established capital well look i know that there's a lot of negativity around about the chances of academy players because of the, the flood of players from overseas and because the numbers are just mind-boggling and it's it's hard to see how everyone can have a development path but i also know um on the flip side of that that young players are being told look, Chelsea aren't what they were, and you've probably got a better chance of 
breaking into this team or squad in the next two to three years than you ever would have had, say, you know, you know, the last 20 years under when, when Chelsea were winning everything, because, you know, that, that was a, a squad just full of absolute international world-class players. And, you know, Chelsea aren't that anymore. Chelsea are very different. And so I do know that players are being told, don't listen to the noise quite so much. Don't worry, because actually, if you look at it with a um, a clear head, you might actually look at it and think, do you know what? I fancy myself, I fancy in two or three years, I'll, I'll be as good or if not better than some of the players in this squad. So it's kind of which side of that you, you really fall on. Um, I haven't I haven't heard the, I've, I've read the Real Madrid and PSG rumours. I haven't heard them at all. I'm always a, a little bit reluctant to get too carried away when clubs that size are, are linked with kids who've never even made a first team appearance because it, it's pretty unusual the foreign clubs actually end up doing it without a, f- a first team appearance at all albeit everyone will be looking at, at you know Chelsea's academy is so famous and the talent they produce has always been so good that people are always looking at them and because of Chelsea bringing in so many kids from abroad at the moment that you know people will see opportunities it'll be an interesting one what happens with him because he, he went on tour I think before tour I said and, and we discussed, I mean, I wasn't the only person who said this. It's not exactly um, a great piece of analysis. But, you know, there's always kids on tour who do do good for themselves, whether it be they earn a first team squad place or whether it earns them a better move than maybe we were expecting at the start of the summer. And, and he's probably it at the moment, unless I've missed someone obvious that I can't think of. He's He's probably, because of some of the messaging around him from the club and because he went away and... You know, he seems to be doing well for himself. He seems to be the one who's who's emerged a little bit. I would imagine he will go out on loan. They'll be looking for a good loan for him um, to develop. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with him now. Do you see Any how I skillfully surprises? avoided saying his name because yeah. I can't pronounce it? A keen You, you a got this. You're, you're more than capable. <laughs> uh, any other surprises that might leave that we haven't talked about that you're hearing about? Oh, surprises, 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 surprises. Nah, I don't think there's going to be an awful lot of shocks, if any. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I always come off these pods and then think, damn, I forgot so-and-so because the squad's so hard to to, to keep abreast of sometimes. But um, no, I, I can't think of a, a shock, a shock departure. I don't think there's going to suddenly be some like first-team player who they accept a bid from nowhere for. No, I, I, I think we know... The players they're trying to move, whether it be sales or loans, whether it be for development reasons or whether it be to get them off the books completely. I think we know the key players and I think I think we kind of know who they see as the first team squad now. It's quite easy to see how they want this to shake down. I don't think there's any great mystery to it at all. Yeah, I have uh, in, in my list that I put together uh, for YouTube, I have... Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eleven loans that need to be done, and uh, one, two, three, four, f- so nine sales, so roughly twenty players that need to leave or yeah. be demoted down to the U twenty three. There's a lot. There's a lot the... of work. There's a lot of work to be done. But I, I recall, uh, you know, how many weeks out are we of the transfer window now? Three, three weeks, something like that. Um, a little more than three, yeah. It's, yeah, it's I, I recall this time days. This time last year, I remember I remember there was a point last year where I sort of panicked on Chelsea's behalf and thought, they're just not going to... They've got so many outs to do. And yet they did them. You know, not, not all of them worked out to be brilliant. I think there is going to be an issue around the, the foreign loans and how... I, I think there's just so many players who they'd probably like to loan out ab- abroad but can't or so many players that they'd like to actually sell who might end up having to do a overseas loan that their hand might be forced on a couple of outs in terms of not doing exactly what they want to do on, on some of them. But that, that's going to happen with the sheer number of players they've got. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work to do. But they'll, on the outs, I'm, I'm confident they'll, they'll get through it, to be honest with you. Okay. Well, let's take a quick break, talk about a couple of incomings, and then... 
uh, the start of the season coming up. So uh, thank you to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. All right, Matt, um, the incoming's a little bit easier to tackle at this point because yep. Chelsea have, I think, done most of what they set out to do earlier in the window from an incoming's perspective. Players like Dewsbury Hall, uh, Kelly Mungiu, uh, Tosin Adarabayo, uh, they've banked uh, future capital on players like Esteval and, and Kendry Paez in South America. There's another one in Gabriel Mech that they are working on, if not yeah. have signed by the time you're listening to this. They just announced uh, Ansel Mino um, from Boca Juniors this morning. Uh, that's been long rumored. Uh, he's a kind of one for the future at center back. And then the big one that you know I think a lot of us were looking at with the Connor Gallagher deal being uh, completed is Samu Omarodion coming back to Chelsea presumably as the backup development striker uh, for roughly 35 to 40 million pounds, whatever the hell it owned up being. Um, this is uh, been a couple months in the making, it feels yeah. like, and seemed dead until a couple of days ago, but it's now been revived. Talk about any of the incomings, but particularly interested in your thoughts on, on Samu. Yeah, look, Samu first got wind of when I was away at the Euros, I remember, and I, I hadn't really... I remember when someone first mentioned him on the phone to me and it hadn't been written about anywhere and I, I genuinely hadn't heard of him. I genuinely hadn't heard of him. Um, and I went and did a little bit of research, same kind of research as anyone would do, typed his name into Google and watched some videos and read as much as I could upon him. And then it became kind of obvious why they're after him because it was at the time when they were also uh, talking to Villa on John Duran and he's a very similar profile of strike a similar age i think he's a little bit younger i think he's 20 very powerful very quick physical attributes absolutely insane clearly a very high developmental ceiling and clearly extremely raw which is exactly what john duran is so it, it felt to fit exactly what they've been looking at that seems to be what they want i think he scored eight goals on loan at alves last season so he's yet to be prolific uh but he's clearly talented and he's clearly what they want in that they want someone they feel they can actually make into a world-class striker rather than signing a world-class striker which i know a lot of fans would like them to do but he's going to play in the olympics for i know he's very high look having been out in the euros by the way i did speak to some spanish journalists about him um and managed to ask their opinions on him because as i said i didn't really know who the guy was and there is a feel. There was a feeling among the Spanish journals that this guy will eventually be Spain's number nine. You know, Spain, all Spain are lacking, and I say lacking. They're European champions, and you'd already have them down as one of the favourites for the World Cup. But all Spain are lacking is a sort of out and out striker. You know, Morata was playing up front, and the feeling certainly in the Spanish journalists was was that this lad's going to be their number nine fairly soon, and certainly in time for the World Cup. So they obviously rate him very highly, um, and he's very very well rated out there. I find it w slightly weird that his situation at Atletico seems to have changed so much, because when he was first linked, the noises out of Atletico were very much, no, 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 yeah. unless it's crazy money, we're not, we're not selling this lad. We're, he's going to be sort of our number two striker this season, um, and he's going to get a lot of opportunities. Apparently Simeone loved him or loves him, and then they go and signed Alexander Sorloff. And you're like, what? Why are they signing Alexander Sorloth? Did very well at Villarreal, but completely different sort of profile. Um, and it was always clear that Sorloth wasn't going to be the number one. That You know, it, it now transpires it's Alvarez who's going to be the number one. But even at that point, they were going to sign another striker. So the minute they got Sorloth, I think the door opened for, for Samu to leave. And, and Chelsea were always in pole position. They have got themselves a nice relationship with Atletico Madrid. They get on well. Um, they they put themselves. They they were very confident that at any point that Atletico would agree to sell, they were well at the front of the queue and could do it quickly. That seems to have happened. Uh, it seems to going to be about thirty five million, very long term contract again, probably seven year job. He's got to play in the Olympic final yet. Uh, so whether they can do a medical before then or whether that it all just has to wait for then, but you know, it will be quickly wrapped up after that. The only thing I would say is to remember after the Olympics, I'm, I'm assuming, and I, I haven't been told this is absolute fact. He will be due a break. I think he'll probably be due a yeah. 10 day to two week break. So he's probably not going to link up with Chelsea 
before the first game of the season, even just to train because he will be due a break. So it's clear that he's not coming in to step straight into the first team. And it's clear that he's going to, this season, need time because he's not going to have a, you know, he's not going to have had any pre-season with Chelsea coming to a foreign league. I don't know whether he speaks English or not. Um, so the, he's going to need time. He's going to need a lot of time and patience because he's yep. going to come straight off an Olympics from a break, join Chelsea when the season's already started. So, and that's why I think, and look, I know there's different information around on this, but I have been told that Ossiemen as a potential loan is not dead. Uh, that if any stage Napoli show a willingness to loan Ossiemen rather than sell him, that Chelsea will look at it. Um, I've been told that by a very good source, um, but at the moment Napoli haven't shown any willingness to loan him. But should they do, then Chelsea are saying they'll be there. And that's why I guess they are willing to do that because Nicholas Jackson has also had no pre-season, as you know better than I, uh, because of an injury he had at the end of last season with his ankle. So they, they've, they've currently got Nicholas Jackson, who's had no preseason coming off an injury, and probably Samu, who's going to come in late, uh, which probably explains why if they could get Ossiman on loan, I think they'd do it. I do think Gui, 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 are we saying? Giu. Giu will probably be allowed to go out on loan come come the end of the transfer window once, once Samu is in the building and once they know what's going on with Ossiman. G- g- give me the odds on this on this loan swap deal that you know it's been rumored in the in the press for a, a few weeks now about Lukaku going to Napoli and Osman coming to Chelsea on loan was I I would assume some sort of sweetheart deal there just to make make it all work like it just seems so damn unlikely but maybe maybe I'm wrong. Look, if it gets to the end of the window. And you've got a striker in Lukaku who only wants to join Napoli, really. And you've got a striker in Ossiemen who's telling people he'll never play for Napoli again, supposedly, allegedly, I should add in. Uh, um, then they might have to find some sort of deal. These days, it's always separate deals. It wouldn't be a swap. But whether they could both do loans with obligations or both do loans with options that, that end up getting them both out of a, a problem, don't rule it out. I know Conte wants a lot of players. Big shock to everybody. He always does want a lot of players. <laughs> um, so I, I do suspect that Napoli were going to have to be creative in the last weeks of the market to keep Antonio happy. Uh, so that would be striker solved. Now we'll, we'll we will talk in the future about how the hell you develop all these players into what you need. Yeah, them that's to another be. conversation. Um, yeah, it's a whole other deal. Uh, but. Um, any other incomings beyond those two now that basically the entire youth systems of the world have been bought up this summer by Chelsea? <laughs> They're still looking at a, a first team winger. I don't quite, I haven't quite got a grasp on if they were to sign Ossiman on loan as well as Samu, whether the winger thing just disappears. And I know that Maresca said he sees Jackson as a striker, but we also know Jackson can play off the left and whether that would change that plan a little bit or whether. It would be Samu, potentially Ossiman if there's a loan deal to be done, and a winger. But there's, there's, they're still looking at this sort of mythical right-footed winger. They were never that interested in Somerville. Um, I know he got linked a lot. I, I think they had a look at him, but they were never, like, strong on him. Uh, it's always It's been hard from the start to find names on the winger, to be honest with you. It's, it's, it's been this sort of, like, so mythical right-footed winger without being able to get any clarity on any names. And this is meant to be on the left, right? To this be, is meant to be uh, on the left, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, I'm told they're still looking at that situation. It's still a live situation, but, but it, it's not something they will 100% do. Um, I think they think they, they can get through without. It's, it's not something that they need to panic on, but we shall see. And I assume that based on our previous discussion about uh, outgoings, a lot of it will depend on the fee structures they can get for a lot of these players that are hoping to move on. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of a lot of haggling over fee structures and yeah, bonuses. I mean, even in Connor's uh, deal, there's this. They've put in a, a matching clause. I mean, I can't I can't see a scenario given what's happened the last few weeks where Connor's ever going to come back to play for Chelsea 
under the the people who are in charge now. Uh, but there has been a matching clause being put in his contract. So if two years down the line, Atletico accept a bid from Tottenham, let's pluck out the air. Chelsea can match it and leave it up to Colin. Um So yeah, there's going to be all sorts of things. There's, there's actually also, there's, there's this interesting thing. I, I don't know how closely you look at my club, Villa, probably not at all, but Villa have started doing this thing with young players where like two of them have come back who went last summer. So Cameron Archer went to Sheffield United and Phila Jean went to Hull on permanent deals, but written into their deals. Phila Jean had a matching thing like that, that Chelsea have done on Connor. And Archer had this weird thing that if Sheffield United go down, an automatic deal kicks in for him to return to Villa at a certain fee. And mm. it, again, it seems it's a, it's a bit of a PSR trick, but it's also a bit of a sending players out to develop them without having to necessarily use the loan system. And so you get money in for your PSR and you end up putting it out again. I think more clubs will do that. I think we're going to see a lot of these weird, creative ways of doing things. And by the way, the, the lad Kellyman who who came from Villa to, to Chelsea, I think he he will go out on loan. Uh, but I'd imagine in this country come the end of the window. Well, yeah, you only have the, the six international loan spots, so you have to use those uh, exactly. incredibly wisely. Uh, and so there's hopefully a lot of uh, English teams who are willing to deal with Chelsea on some loans. Um, I, let's just uh, quickly uh, talk about uh, Maresca and what needs to happen before the start of the season to close this out. Uh, he didn't seem to have a great time on preseason tour. Uh, we know that these preseason tours can be very difficult. Uh, the amount of travel, the amount of change of venues, um, all this stuff didn't seem to be a particularly successful commercial summer for Chelsea. Just looking at the way that the stadiums were sold, you know, they, they hopefully will get back and now quote unquote, the real preseason can start. Although, you know, good luck drumming up future interest for these tours. If that's going to be the attitude, um, what, what are your thoughts on like the, let's take the top two things that need to happen before Manchester city on the 18th for this team to feel like they have a fighting chance. Cause they're staring down the barrel right now. I think. <laughs> good to start on a positive. Um, Look, Call it I, the way I see it, man. Look, 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 and that's completely fair, and you should. Um, look, I think people – look, I, we hear this every year, but I, I, I think people are going to have to be patient. I can't see a scenario where Chelsea suddenly or Maresca suddenly finds a magic formula and this thing clicks into business in August or even September. I think it's, I think it's going to be an inconsistent stroke, rocky start, and – in the hope that it, it comes better. The, the, the hope for Chelsea, I think, within that is that I think because we're coming off a of Euros and an Olympics and everyone seems to have had slight, a lot of the big clubs seem to have slightly strange sort of tours where they've hardly had any of their best players and things. I do think there's going to be a lot of clubs who start slowly. I do think that, that that's going to be a theme, that the, the league and the results might look very different to what the reality is in the first couple of months of the season. I see City starting slowly as they normally do. I obviously see Chelsea starting slowly. Liverpool have got a transition process with slots. I could see them having some ups and downs. I think Villa could start slowly. They're not used to having so many players back late um, after international tournaments. And they've got the Champions League to worry about. So, look, I think there's going to be a lot of clubs who have difficult starts. And I think it's going to be a while till we see a real shakedown. But it's clear that Maresca needs to find a balance between his ideal philosophy and what is realistic to achieve uh, what needs to be achieved in the short term. There's going to have to be a bit of give and take there. Um, And he seemed to nod to that after the Real Madrid game when he talks about the high line and actually, you know, the fact that he does actually want them to drop a bit lower and that he thinks it's a habit rather than what he's telling them. I I found the messaging around that a little bit weird because he seemed to say something that contradicted that after the last after the game before then. Um, but yeah, he's going to have to find I, he's going to have to find a balance, and it's it's the defending I think that's going to be the difficulty for them because you got even if Sanchez plays, it's kind of quote unquote a new goalkeeper in a way because he didn't play for so long at the end of last season. He was, had an injury hit season. Feels even with him, it's a bit of a punt in the dark. 
We don't know about the new goalkeeper. All goalkeepers who come in from abroad have to get used to England. Apart from the right back, there's not a single defender who I would say I'd be confident you can say we'll get a 7 out of 10 every single week. Uh, I think they'll fluctuate wildly. The midfield needs to shake down. Lavia's coming in from a whole year out. The fernandez Caicedo thing, I still haven't really seen it work with them together. I've seen Caicedo work without Fernandez, and I've seen Fernandez sort of work on his own without necessarily working in tandem. I just think people are going to have to be real, realistic about where this is, and I, I just don't think it's going to happen quickly or easily, is my personal view. Yeah, I, I am... I said this after the last preseason game. I have Chelsea between 8th and 14th by Christmas. That is... <laughs> what were where, they last Christmas? I mean, they were down by 11th or 12th, weren't they? Uh, like I think it was I think it was 11th. They seem, they uh, seem to get they, stuck in one position for absolutely months, and even if they won, they couldn't get yeah. out of that position. Yeah, because they it was like basically after Christmas where they started to, you know, I think, improve results and, and the team started to yeah. look a little bit more coherent. And But it took all the way up into that point to, you know, they lost at Wolves on Christmas Eve, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, it yeah. was like, I think after that, the results started to turn around a little I bit. Mean, I mean, I yeah, can was, see it being quite a similar, t- I, I, I sort of, I, I kind of, I'm tempted to agree with you because I can see it being a similar sort of season to last season where the first half of the season is very difficult and then Shaky, maybe in the second yeah. yeah and you come to start to see what's what's really happening in the second half of the season and surely that's only really to be expected particularly as they've got the challenge of thursday nights with the conference league with very very strange turnarounds i mean i know that better than anyone else with, with my club you have some very strange turnarounds after the, the trips um that lads another layer of complexity so yeah it <laughs> I don't see it being an easy season, put it that way. And even the Conference League qualifier doesn't look particularly easy, whoever they get, whether it's, it's Braga or is it Servette? The, the, Servette, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, ne- uh, by the neither way, neither of them's a gimme. In two, two and a half in three weeks. I mean, that that's that's coming up quick. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going to be, a, it's, look, it's going to be challenging. They, they might look, they, they might prove us all wrong and click into gear very quickly. But I've, I've seen and heard nothing to suggest. That that's going to happen and you're also relying on you know cole's going to be fascinating this season because i am not doubting that lad's talent in the slightest he is so talented he is so good but he's going to now come in and in, he had the under 21s last summer so you know he knows how to come off a tournament and play but obviously he's coming off a tournament to play with the pressure with the focus defenders are going to probably be a bit different with him this season probably try and rough him up a little bit as well It'd be really interesting how how Cole does because if he repeats what he did last season, I mean, my word, um, just to actually repeat that season would be utterly incredible. Let alone better yeah. it. So he's got a big job on his hands, and you know, Chelsea really only achieved sixth because of him last season. Let's face it. Without if he'd have been fifteen percent less, they'd have probably ended up in about ninth, tenth, maybe. Yep. Well, uh, well, Matt, obviously enjoy your upcoming holiday. We'll speak to you after you're back. But uh, Chelsea fans, we have plenty of content coming at you. We will be going live after the Inter Milan match on Sunday, right after that. And then plenty of, uh, of content coming your way next week. So uh, look, uh, please subscribe on YouTube. We're doing a lot of good work over there. Uh, we have a couple of really fun videos coming out and then all of your preseason content that you're used to, including our soon to be debunked predictions, uh, will be coming out right before the, uh, the city game, uh, next week. So until next, until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.